We're going to talk about uh, fully restrained connections. We've been talking about simple connections, CD connections, sandwich connections, things like that. Talks lots of details about how to design those members. Now we're going to start talking about fully restrained connections. And, and, and actually, they're pretty straightforward design. Even though they're way more complicated, way more expensive, way more kind of exciting, in fact, um, than simple connections, they're, they're actually really easy to design. And what you're going to do in, a, in, in one of these connections is, is really you're going to think about them. They're, they're, they're consist of tension, compression, and shear connections that in combination provide moment resistance. But for the beam splices are pretty straightforward. Now, beam splice. We can actually think about this beam splice as being made up of a component. Tension and compression. Tension and compression. So we have to provide, when, when, when we design these beam splices, we have to think of the load being transferred through the splice. It goes through the plates, through the bolts, through the top member, through the bolts again, through the plate. We have to provide a load path. We have to provide enough capacity along that load path to get that load from one place to the other. We do the same thing down here. You'd say, hey, this is tension, this is compression, that's cool. Now, whoa, whoa, compression. We don't really think about designing these type of connections for um, compression. And you're right, you don't. No, it's, it's, it's common, though, that, that load reversal happens. It always happens. You, you think it doesn't happen, but it finds ways to happen. So even though this is typically in tension, this is typically um, in compression down here at the bottom, load reversal happens and um, they may switch. What's commonly done is whatever you design for tension, you use the exact same bolt layout, the exact same plate size um, for compression. Now, when we talk about shear, we're talking about load being transferred again through the web, through the bolts, through the center plate, through the bolts again, and then back um, to this web. Okay, so, so again, this is, this is designed very similarly to a simple connection. Um, this is something that you've done before on homeworks and you, you should know how to do. It's just bolts, plates, and, and, and shear, and block shear, and, um, and coming up, providing a load path again. And that's what we're going to be doing over and over again. Is we're going to be checking and looking at the different parts of the load path. So fixed connections between beams and columns are a little bit more challenging, but, but, but not really. The design of the tension and shear elements are, are pretty straightforward. Again, we're going to have our couple, right, tension up here. We're going to have compression down here. So our tension load has to be transferred through these elements. Our compression load has to be transferred through these elements. And our shear has to be transferred through these elements. We do the same thing. We, we can take our moment. We can break it up into two equivalent moment arms and design this connection for that tension force. It, we usually mirror, um, mirrored, uh, mirror the, the, this design down here um, to the bottom, use the same sizes, same bolts, same welds, etc. And do the same thing with the shear um, in the center. Provide the capacity through the bolts, through this, this angle, back to this member. But we have to think about, we have to think about the load path. We have to think about getting the load from one place to another. And this starts to introduce some new concepts. This starts to introduce this concept, this idea, that you know what, we could have issues in here in compression. We actually could have local web buckling, local web problems from this compressive force going through here. Now, I don't think there's much to worry about in tension, but since, again, load reversal can happen, we usually would end up putting a stiffener down here at the bottom, and we usually end up putting a stiffener down here um, up, up at the top as well. Now, we're going to talk about how to design those stiffeners, but oftentimes what people do is they just use them. They just place them. They're just something common that they do all the time. So this zone can fail in local yielding, web crippling, compression buckling. Remember, if you run into problems, you can always add stiffeners, and that's what people just do. They oftentimes don't do any calculations. They just add stiffeners. Okay, so now let's talk about a different connection. And Oh, oh nope, I take that back. Um, now we talk about how to, how to actually calculate what these values are. Um, and th this it's very similar to a calculation that we've done in the past, this idea that this load can spread out, and we have to provide some kind of um, capacity in this area. Local web yielding is the same phenomenon that we talked about with um, seated connections, exactly the same. We have this PBF, uh, this, this equation that, that actually simplifies to 2 times theta r1 times, this is the thickness of your, of your connection here, this is the, the thickness of this bottom plate, times theta r2, and um, that will give you what your um, load capacity is, right? What, what, what that can withstand. Okay, and if it can't make it, what do you do? You add a stiffener. Not that big of a deal. And remember, phi R1 and phi R2 are in the column, are, are, um, are in the back of the manual. Okay? Now, we, we do the same thing with uh, web crippling. The, the thing looks a little differently. It looks a little ominous. Lots of different 
there, um, things there, but we'll find out there's really, they're all constants. And again, we can take this down to 2 theta r3, t, f, b, theta r4. These are, again, constants that you can find inside the manual in, in the table that we talked about previously. The, so the above limit states are included to limit deformations of the column. If, if, we're, if we're counting on this system to be stiff and provide rotational stiffness, we can't have any local movement or yielding or buckling, et cetera, in our, in our web. We just can't have it. It just, just can't happen. If we do, then this will move. And if it moves, we're not get, getting the capacity that we think. We're not getting that phi, uh, that rotation versus moment capacity that, that, that we hope to. So the above limit states are included to limit deformation of the column. The web of the column can also fail. This is something new. This problem is the same as the buckling of a fixed, fixed plate. Fixed, fixed plate. Okay? And <laughs> this is the Euler buckling equation. The Euler buckling equation for a plate. Huh. Maybe the first time you've ever seen something like this. Okay? And that... That's cool and all. I mean, it's, it's similar to the euler buckling equation we've talked about with columns in, in the past, but this is for, for, for a plate. And we are actually not going to use this equation ever again. It simplifies. It uses things that are, that are much easier. But research shows that weaker steels, when I say weaker, I mean things like A36, actually act more like a simply supported beam. So these actually, actually act more like pins than, than they do fixed connections. And higher strengths, but like 100 KSI, act more like fixed connections. Again, these are these would be a fixed type connection, and that's going to change your K. That's going to change what, what, what capacity you end up calculating. Um, based off empirical data, the following equations have been derived. And you know, there's been a there's a lot more work that needs to be done on plates, on plate buckling in general. We've done a lot of work on columns, but not that much on plates. But all of this is simplified, and this is not in some table. This is something that you just have to have on your cheat sheet, or you have to remember. Okay, phi is 0.9, 4100, T cubed, that's the thickness of the web, okay, F, Y, um, the, the yield strength of the web, squared the yield strength of the web over the height, which is the um, clear distance uh, um, of the web. There's that equation. So, again, when the previous limit states are not satisfied, guess what? You put a stiffener on it. You throw a stiffener, you slap it on, no big deal. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that expensive, and there are so many engineers out there that don't even know those calculations. They don't even check stiffeners. They just put them on. But you need to recognize load transfer. You need to recognize that there could be a problem. And when you recognize that, that's when it leads you to those checks. That's when it leads you to using those stiffeners where they're actually needed. So when the previous limit states are not satisfied, a stiffener can be used. Here are some suggestions. Stiffeners can be designed as columns or beams. If, if web yielding crippling is a concern, then a partial depth stiffener um, can be used. If web buckling is a concern, then a full depth stiffener um, is needed. And here's a picture of full depth. Here's partial depth. I'm not sure why you would have partial depth in one and full depth in another. I think it's just for illustration purposes. Usually you're going to use partial depth on both or full depth on both. And again, the thickness of your stiffener always needs to be greater than or equal to the thickness of your, of your um, member over two. It's the thickness of your bottom flange or your top flange of your connection over two. MoMA connections are typically extremely expensive to construct, and show, so should be avoided if possible. However, if you got to have them, you got to have them. That's fine. And one should design them so that they are easy to construct. Now, it is your job as a structural engineer to not only think about how something is designed and how things, but 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 how things come together, how it's going to be built, and you need to provide a, a, a method for something to be constructed or you need to have a method in your brain. Now, the contractor may come back to you and say, I don't want to do it that way. I think that's dumb. I want to use this piece of equipment. I want to use this. I, how about like this? Okay, that's great. That's what you want. You want them thinking. It's a team effort, but you cannot design things that cannot be constructed. Okay? You're doing nobody any favors to do things like that. You have to design things that can be constructed. So you have to come up with a plan. How do I do that? And we're going to talk about some some constructability issues coming up. Like I said, hey, this is the same thing I said before. Hey, these things are expensive. We should avoid them. But if you have to have them, you need to provide an example. You need, you need to think about it. And, and oftentimes, sometimes on plan sets, you will provide a, a um, construction methodology or you will, will provide a construction sequencing. So I said well, this. What if I have a column? And I'm going to fabricate my column, and I'm going to fabricate a seated connection. So it's already made there in the shop. It's already pre-welded in place in the shop. It's already got the stiffener pre-welded everything. 
and a sandwich plate. Now notice I didn't say sandwich plates. I'm doing this with a single-sided plate, a single-sided sandwich connection. Okay, That puts a little bit of eccentricity in, into the connection, but it's so much easier to build. Okay, So then we're going to lift the beam into place with the crane, place it on the seated connection, adjust the beam with the crane so that the holes in the web match the angles. That's, that's critical. Okay, Oftentimes you want to be able to move this around you want to be able to take a cheater bar or something like that, or even the bolts themselves, shove them in the hole. At least get them in the holes. And once they're all in the holes, you can let go. You can let go with the crane. You can put the bolts on the other side. Place the bolts in the web, um, in the web holes, and tighten. Great. Hey, but that's not a fixed connection yet. We have no load transfer at the bottom, and we have no load transfer at the top. We need more. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a plate and bring it up here to the top. And we're going to weld the plate to the bottom. So we've got a full penetration weld here. We've got weld a fillet weld around the outside of this plate. Maybe it's on both sides. Maybe it's all the way around. Whatever you need. But all of this welding is being done without the crane holding the beam. Okay? It's all being done without the crane holding the beam. So again, you get this, this great connection, this great connection, this great connection. Now we have load transfer in here. We have load transfer in here. You know what? You might even want to pre-weld the stiffeners. You may even want to pre-weld the stiffener here and wherever it is up here. Pre-weld the stiffeners on. You already know you're going to need them. You already know you want to put them on. You know, actually, this stiffener should probably should be moved down a little bit. You want to think about my compression force is coming here. I want to place my stiffener about here. Again, should probably pre-have pre -have those stiffeners already in, in place. So again, you're just finally making this weld in the field. This is this isn't rocket science. This isn't crazy complicated but you need to provide them a logical method to make the connection. It will make you a better designer and make it easier for, your, for things to be constructed. Everyone wins when you do things like this. Okay, so now let's do some examples out of the Salmon and Johnson book. We're not even doing examples. We're just talking. These are some examples that they have provided that they claim are details that can be used with full MoMA connections. And I say, Pasha. I say, no way. I say the large majority of these connections can never and should never be intepted and in my mind should be removed from the textbook. I think they just poison the minds of young structural engineers. Okay, so what do I mean by this? I get so upset and worked up. Well, you need to be able to build these things. You need to be able to think about how these things could be built. And let's look at this first one. It's column. Okay, they have a column. They have a beam here. They have a beam here. They have full pin welds, top and bottom, and a weld on the, on the um, web. Okay, interesting. That's cool. I can see load transfer happening. That's good. That's not the problem. How are you going to build this? So you get the column in place. What are you going to do? Are you going to pre-weld these beams on the column before you actually lift it up? Because that's the only way you'd actually be able to build it. Without out that, the crane would have to be holding this beam in the air while the welds are being made on the top and bottom flange. A full penetration weld while being held by a crane? No. No, no, no. Don't ever do this or I will come and find you and get you. Okay? Never, ever, ever do something like this. Okay. Is this one any better? I don't think so. I mean, it's the same, except they've added stiffeners. I guess those stiffeners could be pre-added in the shop beforehand. You would never ship this whole thing or very, very rarely ship this whole thing out to the job site pre-constructed. You'd need some construction on the job site. Okay, we go to this next one. This connection isn't much different than the other ones. Still has a lot of the same issues. They're saying though, instead of using stiffeners, you could use T's. Oh my gosh. Never, ever, ever do this. Don't. How would you weld this? First of all, you're going to have to have a weld all the way along here and a weld all the way along here. And I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why this is so much less weld up here, just using a stiffener straight across. So much easier to transfer load in something like this. Okay. If you look at this connection too, you're going to have to weld the stem of the T down. How do you do that? How do you get your welder inside of here and weld these things? That's going to be a, you know, a vertical weld. These are going to be very hard to do, maybe even an overhead weld if, if, if it's in place. No, this is crazy. This is nuts. Even if you do it flat. No, 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 no. Don't do something like this. Okay, this one's got a shot. They've got a, a, an angle here that, that could be that could be pre-welded in place. They've got some stiffeners that could be pre-welded in place. They could have had a sandwich plate that's pre-welded in place. They could drop this sucker in, weld this side of the angle, slap the plate on top, weld it, and weld it. This is okay. 
This is okay, no problems. This one, I'm not sure how in the world you would ever build this. Look at this plate at the bottom and plate at the top. It just doesn't make any sense. Are you going to pre-weld these in place? I mean, if not, you're going to be doing a full penetration weld hanging from a crane, which is nuts. Okay, so I'm not sure how this would be done. Same thing here. Um, well, this has got an angle at the bottom. I guess you, this could be pre-welded. This could be pre-welded. This is doable. This is doable. Um, I guess this is doable. I mean, you could pre-weld these these T's and one of these. Now, you're, but to get this in place, you're going to have to slide the beam. You have to bring the beam down with the crane and slide it into place. Okay, that's that's crazy. Okay, that's just it's just way more complicated than it needs to be. I guess you wouldn't have to. I guess you could just have the bottom T on there. Bring it into place, slap the top T on there, and then do the weld. That's 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 a lot of welding in the field. This is a pretty cool connection. I like this connection a lot. This plate is already prefixed to the back of the of of the um, eye shape. You bring it into place and you bolt it. The problem I have with it is the crane has to hold it as you put the bolts in. You can't just put it down and drop it. Okay? You can't just put it down and drop it. And that's what you want to be able to do. Onward we go. Now, this is a, they try to make some connections here where instead of connecting to the, the strong axis, they connect to the weak axis. See, this is bending about the weak axis. Try to connect something like that. Now, I'm not sure quite how that works because if you think about putting load in here, you know, some kind of couple, right, that that's, has to be transferred here, how is that not going to weld or yield that? How is that not going to cause that web to kick out? That, that just doesn't make sense to me. Same thing up here. I, I'm just not sure how that would ever work or why one would ever do something like that. So, But they have it in the book. Um, um, I just don't connect. Just don't connect to weak axes. If you absolutely have to, go ahead and put a, well, a stiffener back here. Put a stiffener back here. And then, oh great, they have something in here they can put the beam on. That's nice. A little shelf. Put it in place. Put a weld. Put a weld. Okay, cool. Same thing going on here. I don't see this to be that much different. Um, and what's above it. This is odd. This is where they've actually taken the T-section and they've welded it in here. How do you make this weld? How do you make this weld? I have no idea. I mean, hire gremlins to crawl inside here and weld. That is the only way this weld could ever be made. But if it was, I suppose one could come up here and then weld to this plate and it would be pre-stiffened. I guess. I, I, I guess. I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't. I mean, maybe the argument is you don't need the weld all the way. Maybe you only need a weld in a couple places to hold it in place. Of course, then you have shear transfer, and that won't work. So you need the weld. Bad, bad, bad idea. All these are bad ideas. Really just bad ideas. Bad ideas. Again, this one's not perfect. This one's not perfect. I think this is a bad idea. Um, this one's okay, this one's okay. Bad, 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 bad ideas. Don't do it. Think about how you're, going to, how you're going to actually construct your structures. Make them easy. Give the contractors at least one method that you think there is to do it. And they may cuss at you and tell them that you're crazy, that they want to do something differently. But it is your job as a structural engineer to provide a method to construct everything that you dream, everything you draw, everything you design has to be able to be constructible and it is your job to think about how to do that. You owe it to everyone. Thanks.